This is the Ridge Hunter Outdoors podcast, episode four. I'm Canyon Clark here with Nate Burgess, Scott Clark, and Jeff Fry. Tonight we're going to be talking about managing your deer herd during the season. So as we go along, and especially as we get into the off season, we're going to talk a lot about deer management, habitat management, what all goes into that, what you can do to make your property better. But since it is in the season, we'll talk about some stuff that you guys can do now. And we're going to be kind of taking out of two different articles um, off the internet. One of them is on OutdoorLife.com. It was actually published in 2017. It's by Craig, Craig Daughtry called The 10 Keys to Successful Deer Management. We won't get into all 10 of them. We'll hit a few of them because there's another article that was originally published in Farming for Wildlife magazine by Gamekeeper by Gamekeepers from Bob Humphrey called Managing Your Deer Herd that I'm going to get into some other stuff where they overlap and I'm going to get into his rather than the first one. So before we do that, I want to add a couple things since we're getting into the season now and we can kind of, at least our local crowd, we can keep you guys kind of updated on what's going on if you're not able to get in the woods yet. Um, I know me and Jeff have been doing a little bit of hunting and then dad in the shop, he should have normally during the year, he had a pretty good idea just based on the deer coming in and what they look like and smell like and everything kind of on where the rut's at. Obviously we don't have much of that going on right now, but I think we do have what we'll call a field report, I guess, from Jeff and then kind of what I had going on tonight. But I know, Jeff, you went out tonight, and I think you were out opening day, too. Um, anything going on there? Obviously, we haven't had very good weather yet. No, it's been it's been hot. Uh, I haven't been able to go in the mornings uh, because the wind, wind hasn't been cooperating with me. <clears throat> Actually, it wasn't really right tonight, but. I just decided I'm, I've got to go. I mean, I can't, I'm on limited schedule here and mm-hmm. I can't just sit around and wait for the wind to be right. If I wait for a North wind, it may be December before I get to go. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, it, it's been hot and humid here in Southern Illinois. Uh, deer activity has been pretty slow. You know, uh, I, I just haven't really seen a lot, uh, just a few does here, there, and yonder, and none of them's been within shooting range. And mm-hmm. now I think um, we got we got a full moon coming up here in the next couple of weeks, the uh, fifteenth to the twentieth. I think that week there, you know, it could it could probably pick up mm-hmm. as far as does and bucks also. Yeah, and so. <laughs> We just need the cool. We need the cooler temperatures. Yeah, that's what we need. It's Definitely. just it's just so hot right now, and even people that it, it guys do kill a doe or a buck, or and wish we've had a couple bucks turned in. But you know, if they do kill them, man, you gotta get on them. Mm-hmm. You gotta get on them. You gotta get them things gutted, and you gotta get them to wherever you're taking them because yeah, these temperatures it works on them whether they're dead or alive, and yeah. You, it's just rough right now. Mm-hmm. I uh, got my first sit in tonight, which was kind of like you. For where I was going, the wind was fine. I just went on a spot that I don't normally hunt a lot that I thought there could be. There are every year, there's generally a couple decent bucks that run through there at some point. But uh, went in there, got on the right edge of it from the wind, and kind of on an oak flat, like we talked about a couple weeks ago, and or last week, a couple weeks ago. <clears throat> and, uh, did have several does come in. I think I was probably in the right spot. They're just didn't, I don't think there's any bucks in there right now where it's at. Um, it's not a place that I can do a lot to habitat wise to try to help hold bucks. It's just some farm ground permission ground that I have to hunt. So, and with it being hot, I didn't want to go into one of my better spots and have a chance of messing something up, you know, on a night like tonight where they ain't that high a chance of seeing anything anyway. So went in, like I said, I did see 10 or 12 does, uh, could have shot a couple of them, with having to do the podcast tonight and everything, I didn't want to, didn't want to do that and have to mess with it. And then again, in the heat, you know, um, but that's kind of most of what we've been hearing. I know you can talk a little bit about what guys have been coming in at the shop. And as Jeff said, we got a couple bucks in, but no, maybe one nice mature buck. That's, that's pretty much it so far. Yeah. One nice mature buck, uh, mostly does, uh, decent buck, uh, last night, uh, the, the, the thing about that mature buck that we got, um, it's an out-of-stater. Uh, he comes in and he hunts. He got some ground here. Actually, he's from Pennsylvania. 
and uh, he he he's a guy I could trust to not stretch the truth, kind of tell you how things are. And he said, yeah, he, he, he gets that out of the way early. He cameras up like what we were talking about in the podcast before. He cameras up in uh, September, August and September. He had this thing patterned, knew what it was going to do. Went out there the first night he sets in the stand. He, he knocks this thing down. It's 150-ish. I, I didn't score it. 150. I was so, thinking 140s probably. So it's 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 definitely a shooter buck for him and for here. And uh, he was thrilled to death. And mm-hmm. so that's that's what he does. He gets that out of the way early. Yeah. And as long as he's happy with it, it don't matter if it scores 120. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And that's yeah, another exactly. thing I wanted to hit on. And I was going to talk about it in my next video too. With some of the stuff we've been talking about, what we're focused on mostly is giving guys advice or tips for hunting a mature deer herd whether that be mature bucks or mature does either one but having the best opportunity to kill what is a good buck for your area now that's all relative too if you're in the northern part of michigan maybe a two and a half year old 115 inch deer is the biggest deer as you're going to be able to shoot so maybe that's that's what you're looking at down here in southern illinois four and a half five and a half six and a half year old bucks you get into 140s all the way up to 180s there's plenty i mean there's 200 inch deer around in places where we're at um so that's kind of the guys we're talking about but we're not trying to keep anybody from hunting the way they want to hunt this is it's when it all boils down to is this deer hunting so you hunt the way you want to hunt don't let us keep you from doing what you want to do we're just trying to help some guys that maybe want to hunt for more mature deer and that's their goal but maybe they don't necessarily know how to get there or know how to sort through all the misinformation that's out there to do that so i just wanted to kind of hit on that too we're not trying to tell anybody what they should do, what's right or wrong. There are very few hard, fast rules when it comes to deer hunt. And I think everybody here would probably agree with that. I mean, you got your wind that you always want to watch. I mean, but like I said, there there are very few just hard and fast rules to deer hunting. And everybody does it their own way. One guy may like something works for him. Another guy may like something that works for him. So nothing that we say, very little that we say. It's something that is a hundred percent right all the time. I mean, nothing we say is going to be a hundred percent right, but we're uh, we're just trying to help you guys that are trying to kill more mature deer and hunt and have more mature bu- more mature bucks on your property, that kind of thing. So don't let us uh, keep you from hunting the way you want to hunt. And to get out there and enjoy it, it's hunting. So that's I just wanted to say that too before we got into this too much. Well, yeah, I mean that's that's a thing that everybody deals with. You know, everybody wants to kill this. 200 inch or new state record or new world record buck you know and stuff but you know if it's your first buck and it's only 110 inches good for you exactly you know nobody should put you down for it mm-hmm. you know you're proud of it. you know i've got i've got five bucks on my wall and they range from 120 inch gross up to 160 inch gross you know I've killed bucks in between there and that, you know, and I didn't mount them. I mounted the best ones, but right now I've I've done the Pope and Young. I'm looking for a Ben and Crockett. Now, do I encourage everybody else to do Ben and Crockett? No, you do whatever you want to do. Mm-hmm. If you like that buck or that doe or whatever, and that's your best deer, or or you're just happy to take it, then by all means take it. And, exactly. You know, don't let the pressure and all that. St- people judging you and all that don't let that get to you just mm-hmm. do what makes you happy when it comes to deer hunting yeah we got whether guys. you're whether you're just shooting for meat to fill your freezer and feed your family mm-hmm. or put something on the wall if it's if it makes you happy do it yeah we got guys that come in here every year during shotgun season they shoot a spike buck or a four point and they're just tickled to death to do it and that yeah. there's nothing wrong with that and the stuff we're talking about, you can absolutely kill those kind of deer using the stuff that we're talking about. But what we're focusing on, because it tends to be take a lot more information, and there's a lot more misinformation on shooting mature deer, because like you said, most people, that's what they're wanting to do. So that's kind of what right. we're tailoring everything towards. But don't again, don't think we're trying to tell you the way you have to hunt. Or anything we say is just a hundred percent right or wrong, because there are very few things in the hunting world that are just dead set. You have to do this, have to do that. So, wanted to clear that up before we got into anything else, because again, it is hunting. Get out there and enjoy it. We want more people to hunt. We don't want less people to hunt. So, 
hopefully you guys aren't taking anything we're saying the wrong way, but that's that's kind of where we're at. So now we'll get into because we don't really have a rut report because it's the eighth of October, whatever. Yeah, it's pretty much. Yeah, so not really a lot going on there. We'll get into that as we get later. We'll do a rut report every week. Um, and as Nate gets in the woods a little more, gets away from work, he'll be able to help us out with that too for sure. So. We'll jump right in it tonight. Like I said, we're going to talk about managing your deer herd during the season because it is the season now and that's what you can do. So we're going to start in this Craig Daughtry article that I mentioned earlier that's on OutdoorLife.com. And he starts with, hunting big whitetails on private land that you carefully manage is one of the most rewarding endeavors in North American hunting. And there's a ton of literature out there on how to grow deer, no matter what your management goals may be grow trophy bucks, or have lots of deer to hunt. So even right there, he kind of hit on what we were just clearing up. Uh, whatever your goals are, whether you're trying to kill big bucks or just have more deer on your property, this is all stuff that you can kind of use. So like I said, I'm going to pick through his article a little bit and hit some things that the other guy didn't hit on. And then the things they both hit on, I'll take from the other article because he's he gets into it a little more uh, scientifically, we'll call it. But we'll clear that up too because some of that is a little, a little much, I'll say. Um, but the first thing I want to hit on from the Daughtry article is managing predation. Um, we're starting to see a big, in my opinion, a big problem. And what's going to be a worse problem if the state doesn't allow us to do anything about it with bobcats. Now, they're a lot harder on the turkeys and the quail than they are the deer. But they're absolutely a predator for fawns, too, especially in the spring. Even in the fall, a, a good-sized bobcat won't have a problem taking down a fawn. The biggest problem we have predation is obviously coyotes, and the numbers of them have got out of control. They're all over the place. Um, in my opinion, eventually the bobcats will be the same way, and then the state will say after it's too late, go out and shoot them with whatever you want, whenever you want, like they do coyotes. So one way you can help to manage your deer herd in the fall is to take care of those predators. So whether that's a coyote coming by your stand when you got your bow and your deer hunting, um, and you decide maybe you don't want to shoot that coyote because you're messing up your deer hunt. Well, you might mess up your deer hunt by not shooting that coyote. So I always encourage guys to shoot those dogs when they come by. <laughs> not somebody's uh, lassie, border collie, when it runs by. But uh, shoot those coyotes. Um, get out there. It's another fun thing to do, especially uh, if you got some ground that maybe doesn't have a lot of, you know, hunting potential for deer this year and you're trying to work on it. Uh, there's a portion of the season where you can get out at night and hunt those coyotes with a rifle. Um, that can be a lot of fun to do, too. I mean, it's just another way to get out and hunt, be in the outdoors. Predation is definitely a big thing that I think gets overlooked, and whether you take care of it yourself or have a trapper come in and do it, big thing you got to hit on. Well, yeah, I mean, it's like I <clears throat> touched on last week. You know, uh, you get out there and you hit that font fawn in distress you know and coyotes or bobcats come in take them out you know it, uh, if you have it, a tag for a bob deer well yeah here in illinois you gotta have a tag but that's just a minor technicality <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know <laughs> that uh, is if you want to have it mounted or something i don't know <laughs> we'll but, say do everything legally <laughs> we'll just clear that up disclosure. anyway full disclosure yeah if it's a coyote you don't have to have anything for it just shoot the thing well you right, got, anyway yeah, you got to have your hunting licenses. Well, you, and, as you should have anyway. Yeah, and your habitat stamp here in Illinois. I mean, that's right. just part of it. But, <clears throat> yeah, you know, take care of that problem. If there's if that deer activity is slow and you get an opportunity at a predator, well, then do it because you're you're helping yourself more than you're hurting yourself. And uh, I know I got, well, I got one guy at work, and he's got a bobcat on his camera just about every other day you know he sends me pictures of it and stuff and i'm like take him out you know you get a permit and take him take him out and so they're getting more numerous mm -hmm. here uh yeah i've got i've seen and heard one at my place matter of fact i think you got, picture you got pictures of it, of it. Yep. yep at my at my house on just a little 20 acre woods you know mm-hmm so they're they're getting more numerous here in Illinois, and they're going to get to be more of a problem. But Illinois does allow uh, bobcat hunting, 
So, you know, it's, spend, yeah, it's been limited right now. Right. But, but, you know, if you can get your permit, get your permit, take out a bobcat. Yeah. So. You know, it, there's more to just deer hunting than just shooting deer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Especially the herd management aspect of right. it. I remember, uh, oh, probably just back when first, uh, when guys first started getting pictures of bobcats, I want to say 2015, approximately. Um, gosh, I had pictures of them. Uh, I think I had one big old male. Um, he had big old fuzzy cheeks on him. He looked to be just pretty good size. And then I thought I had two different females because one of them had spots all over it. And the other one didn't have but just a few spots on the front leg and a few spots on the back leg. To me, them was, you know, two noticeably different cats. But I get those fairly often. Um, and then my bobcat pictures kind of trailed off, you know, in a couple of years. Uh, I will say that my turkey population did the exact same thing. Of course, we're talking about deer here. Uh, but you can notice, before I had them cats, I had a decent amount of turkeys staying on me or close to me. When them cats showed up, uh, that started dwindling. And now I'll be lucky if there's one tom gets on me where I could where I can hunt him in the spring, you know. Uh, most of the time from now, uh, I'm asking permission to hunt on somebody else, you know, uh, to try to get a turkey in the spring. Uh, so I think those bobcats were tough on the turkeys and the quail, uh, rabbits, I mean, anything they can catch, squirrel. Uh, but yeah, they can definitely take down a fawn too. Yeah. Uh, and then coyotes, you know, if I'm out in the woods hunting anything at all and a coyote comes by, it turns into a coyote hunt. Absolutely. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. uh, capitalize right. on that every chance you get. Uh-huh. I remember <laughs> down there in the bottoms, bobcats hadn't been around very long. And so I was sitting up there in the tree and I was deer hunting and stuff and, and, uh, seen this bobcat come walking down the slough. So I was just kind of admiring him because I'd never seen one before. And he went walking on by, you know, going by his business and that. I did too. Well, then that evening it got dark. I got down. I went walking to the truck. And here I am sitting there at the truck, putting my bow in the case. And that dadgum bobcat, he screamed <laughs> on just on the other side of the levee from me. I don't know if he followed me or what, but, I mean, he was right there. And you talk about, if you hadn't heard one before, mm-hmm. I mean, it would scare the living daylights out of you. I threw my bow in that case, tossed it in the back truck, jumped in the truck, locked the doors, and rolled <laughs> up the windows. <laughs> just in case he opened it and yeah, pulled the door handle. Yeah, and, it's just, and then after I got in the truck and did all that, and then I realized, well, you idiot, you know, it's just that bobcat that you seen, yeah. but... I mean, when Could you're not expecting it, it, yeah, yeah. it'll scare the living daylights out of you. Yeah, definitely. He uh, he talks about pretty much what we just talked about here uh, on bobcats and coyotes. He says, studies have shown that each take their share of young deer. Studies have also shown that controlling predator numbers can have a positive effect on deer populations. That said, it's hard to keep predator numbers down on a consistent basis. You can thin them out for a while, but eventually they work their way back to your property. Knowing this, it's best to thin coyotes before fawning season because that's when the fawns are most vulnerable in the first couple weeks of their life. That's when especially the bobcats and the coyotes both are going to take them out, a lot of them. Um, He says it's important to remember that you aren't the only one taking deer out of the herd. So those predators like hunting the same things we do, especially deer. Um, That's at least what we're focused on here. I mean, obviously, if you're a big quail hunter, a big rabbit hunter, it's the same issue. They're taking out a lot of your prey, a lot of the stuff you want to hunt too. So... Predators are a big one that I want to hit on out of this article because the next one doesn't hit on it. The next one that is also really big is uh, your neighbors. Um, He says, unless you're managing thousands of acres of habitat, which most of us are not, your neighbors definitely have an impact on the deer you hunt. You may be letting young bucks walk, but if your neighbors aren't, you'll wait a whole lot longer to start seeing the shooters you've been waiting for. If your neighbors are taking more does than than the population can bear, your deer numbers will go down. If your neighbors don't believe in shooting does, it may be difficult to keep your deer from eating themselves out of house and home. If your neighbors plant acres and acres of deer food or have an aggressive feeding program in place, you may be seeing fewer deer than you should. So definitely, I know the way all of us hunt, and I know the way most of the people listen into this hunt, neighbors, even guys that are hunting a thousand acres, your neighbors matter. So if you can either get your neighbors on a program with you, or at the very least, figure out what they're doing. So at least if you know that your neighbors are shooting a whole bunch of does, you know you probably shouldn't worry about that. Maybe if you need meat for the freezer, you shoot one and you call it good on the does for the year because you know your neighbors are just going to kill them all out. 
if you know your neighbors aren't shooting any does at all, maybe you know you need to pick up the slack a little bit. The best thing, like I said, uh, good neighbors are worth a lot, whether that's in hunting or anything, just having a house. Uh, everybody knows that. Uh, if you can get your neighbors on a program with you as far as managing mature bucks, if you're all on the same page, that can go a long way because then if you've got 100 acres here and your neighbors have 120 and their neighbors have 50, well, then you're starting to add up ground that's all under the same sort of management program, and maybe your neighbors end up shooting that mature buck, but at least maybe you had a chance at him or he was on your property or the next one you'll get. Um, everybody at least could be on the same page. Now, that's not always possible. And another thing I kind of wanted to add the two together, predation and neighbors, is a lot of stuff we deal with around here is uh, neighbors being sort of predators at night um, from the road using uh, some <laughs> rifles and whatever else you want to call it. Uh, that can be really hard on stuff, too, and that's that's hard to deal with. Obviously, if you see that stuff going on, you want to contact the IDNR um, and get that turned in. That's one we deal with, especially around here, I think, and uh, some certain groups of people can be really hard on deer um, and everything in the wildlife, <laughs> actually. Uh I guess I could probably say who it was because they won't be listening to this anyway because they won't have access to it. But I'll just leave it at that and let you guys figure it out. If you're from around here, you know who I'm talking about. Those neighbors can be really bad and they're really hard to deal with. Uh, something you kind of just have to live with and hope they don't get your big mature deer. Um, but back to regular neighbors, um, what are kind of your guys' thoughts? I think we're probably all pretty much on the same page as far as neighbors go. Um, I, but I know you were talking about some neighbors earlier that are on a certain, I mean, we don't have to mention anything specific, but yeah. kind of a general idea of what they're doing. Or. Anywhere you're at, I feel like it's hard. Uh, it can be difficult to try to hunt bigger than your neighbors. Um, if you don't let it bother you, I guess, you know, you're doing everything you can to implement what you want to do, and you don't let it bother you what they do when you, when you see a nice little eight-pointer that you're thinking, man, he's got great potential. When he disappears over the ridge and you hear a boom, you know, you're like, well, there was that, you know. Uh, but you never know. I mean, if that tickles him to kill that, you know, uh, I, it certainly ain't my right to take that away from him. You know, deer hunting something, you can make it whatever it is. And as long as you're legal, everybody can make it what they want it to be, you know. Uh, but uh, I am fortunate enough to have some spots where the neighbors, we all think, you know, fairly similarly. Uh, we're going to let those smaller ones go. Um, none of us are too hard on the does, uh, right there at home. I feel like we've got an abundant, uh, food supply, uh, these crop fields everywhere, these hay fields scattered around, uh, most of us do some food plots, try to keep some green stuff later in the winter. I've never felt like food supply has been a problem there at home. Um, I don't shoot very many does myself, um, just what I'm going to eat throughout the year. Uh, but anyway, uh, as far as, uh, dealing with the neighbors, some of them shoot more than others, uh, but I uh, I have never felt like I've been overrun with those. I got a bunch of them, but I don't feel like I'm overrun with them. Uh, I always felt like that if I had uh, plenty of does, I was going to maybe hopefully maximize my chances in the rut. Uh, but then again, you can say, ah, you're a nice buck. He's not going to have to go searching for him. He's just going to go from hot doe to hot doe and hot doe and keep her in the thickets, you know. Um, I... Uh, I've not proven myself wrong so far yet, uh, but I can't say that I've proven myself right either, you know. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, us and the neighbors, most of my spots, we get along pretty good, uh, any of them that I know, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you can get the neighbors on board with you for sure, uh, that's when you could all collectively see some really big results. Yeah, definitely. Like I said, you can expand your uh, acreage, I guess. But Well, even if you, even if your neighbors aren't what we'd call necessarily on board right now, uh, maybe you got a youngster that's next door to you, and, or, and and that eight pointer goes over the ridge, and you hear that boom. Okay, that's fine. That's great for him. If he's playing legal, then there's the next one he's not going to shoot because he's already got his buck. Yeah. Or next year or the year after, now he's matured and says, "Hey, you know what? Let's let these walk." And you're going, "You're right." Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I uh. Whenever I first started at that farm that I worked at for years, we had 4,500 acres of ground. And their mentality was, if it's brown, it's down. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and the guys, they all wanted to kill the big buck. The problem was they wouldn't let them mature enough to be big bucks. And so I ran, and, you know, and this wasn't just, this wasn't neighbors. I mean, this was the guys I worked with, you know, employees only was allowed to hunt that ground stuff. <clears throat> so I brought this idea to them. Okay, let's, let's stick to this. If you shoot a buck, you got to get it mounted. You know, well, who wants to mount, pay $450 for a four corn or a little scrub eight pointer. So the guys started letting them go. And, you know, and was shooting does, you know, if they just want meat and stuff. It took about five years and we started seeing results. And we went from 100, and maybe the biggest buck was 125, 130 inch Pope and Young up to guys was killing boot and crockett deer. You know, it took about five years of self-control from everybody. And, of course, you know, neighbors on the other side of the farm, you know, they they was reaping benefits from us too. And I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and say that it wasn't because they was, they wasn't participating in it. But, you know, that part of, they seen bigger deer on their side of the river and stuff. So, you know, you got to kind of get into that mentality if the big bucks is what you want to see. And plus also we were shooting does and, and they, uh, all the studies, what was it, Scott, they were saying back, not too long, or you know, a few years back, you wanted two bucks to every doe. Mm-hmm. There's a lot you of know, studies right. out there now about herd counts and and actually right. how you can go out and count your herd, go out early, count your fawns, and then you can. There's all kinds of formulas you can get on the internet and look up for what whatever you want to manage, how you want to manage, and it talks about deer counts. You just you just Google it, and it'll give you a lot of different things you can look at. But I, th- I, I think there's a one time there's a, what two bucks every doe one. Right? I think at the time it's yeah. a pretty good rule of thumb. Yeah, and so you know ways ways concentrating on does getting doe herd down, letting the bucks mature, and we just had a lot of success with that. And and then uh, we got the blue tongue in 2012, wiped it all out. And <laughs> you know, had to start all over. We had to start all over, and, which is part of it. Yeah, I mean that's part of it. But you know, is a lot of it is just. You know, you, there's a lot to managing a deer herd. And it's not just taking out predators, not just taking, you know, trying to get your doe population down, but you got to let them bucks grow up and mature also. Mm-hmm. And also, you know, I'm not saying if you're, if you're tickled deaf, 125 inch eight pointer, by all means, shoot him. Mm-hmm. You know, if that's what, what makes you happy. But, you know, when we started that program there on that farm, it was just, you know, if they seen a four corn or a little scrub buck or whatever, they just going to shoot it. Mm-hmm. And then they just wondered why they couldn't get big deer there. Yeah. They had the food sources because was, you're talking corn and soybeans is what we, what we grew. They had the food sources and they had the habitat, you know, for the potential. They just wasn't letting the bucks go and grow to their potential and and a lot of that mentality i think with guys even on smaller pieces especially especially the smaller pieces is and we hear this a lot everybody knows the saying um if uh if i don't shoot him my neighbor's going to well if that's your mentality uh and you shoot that buck and now you're that neighbor that shoot that shot that little buck uh, that immature three and a half year old, two and a half year old deer. And your neighbor's still going to shoot one. Exactly. Yeah. So then you're down two. Exactly. Rather than one. Uh, so try not to have that mentality of if, if I don't do it, my neighbor will, because then you become that neighbor and then you've doubled the problem rather than at least kept it where you were. Like where you were talking about, Nate, if that little eight point does run over the hill and you hear that boom and you think, well, that one's gone. Don't let that discourage you from letting the next one walk. Try not to let that get to you. Cause if you let that next one walk, your neighbor's already killed his deer. Yep. So maybe that one makes it through the year. Everyone and that you pass is potentially one that you're going to have another chance at down the exactly. road. Exactly. If you kill them at three and a half, you're not going to be able to kill them at five and a half. And there's yep. a huge difference between antler growth. Even if it's a 130 inch deer at three and a half years old, think about how big that thing can be at four and a half or five and a half. Um, like you, like we've been saying, if three and a half 
your old 130 inch deer is what you want that's fine but we're talking about managing for mature deer and the most you can get out of your property if you want to get the biggest deer you can get you've got to let those two and a half and three and a half year old deer, year old deer walk no matter how big they are if you want to kill a 200 inch deer you can't kill 130 inch three three and a half year old deer two and a half year old deer year after year after year because those are the deer that are going to be the 200 inch deer when they're five and a half four and a half five and a half year old so you got to let those deer go in order to kill them when they're that big um, and you can't let your neighbors dictate your strategy on that. If they're I, killing those small deer, let them kill them. You just got to keep letting them go. Yeah. And you can't all you can't always take your neighbors into account. Also, I mean, there's a you know a deer wakes up in the morning just like the rest of us, and you don't know if you're gonna make it through the day or not. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's so much that goes on in life that can happen to you, and so you know you just can't. Yeah. You can't just put it on your neighbors. I mean, it, it is just what it is. Mm -hmm. It's just life in general. Could and there's, walk right out in front of a semi. Yeah. And exactly. There's, like you said. And that's scary when you're driving a semi. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> there's risk of losing that deer to your neighbors or not your neighbors. Right. But as far as just letting those bucks walk, that's just a risk you got to take if you want to kill big mature deer. You got to let the young ones go. You can't, like I said, you can't kill them at five and a half if you shoot them at three and a half. That's just what it boils down to. So now we're going to get into... The other article by Bob Humphrey, uh, it's called Managing Your Deer Herd Basics. Again, it was in Gamekeepers Farming for Wildlife magazine. So he starts out with some principles of wildlife management, he says. As most folks know, carrying capacity, which is designated as K, is a maximum number of animals of a given species that an area can support without any habitat degradation. Once K, or that carrying capacity, is determined for a particular area, that area can theoretically sustain a population, which is uh, designated as P, of that size indefinitely, all other things being equal. He says, however, all other things are seldom equal. All things nature move toward disorder, in nature move toward disorder. Extrinsic factors like weather, climate, disease, and human intrusion and development can all confound things, which is why you must continually mind your P's and K's, so your population and your carrying capacity. Uh, two things that he's really going to hit on, so we'll try to keep those in mind. Uh, another concept to be familiar with, he says, is a st sustained yield. Some proportion of P, your population, that you can remove and still be guaranteed of having a similar amount available in successive years. The amount you remove is replaced through recruitment, immigration, and reproduction. So essentially what he's saying there is you have to know your property, how many, at least have an idea of how many deer that your property, the way it's set up, can hold, how many deer you have on your property, and then how many of those deer that you have on your property you can kill every year, which is your sustainable yield, you can kill every year and still have that same number coming back the next year, or less or more, whatever you're trying to work with, wherever your deer herd's at now. So if you're trying to make it more, you don't want to kill so many that your yield goes down, your sustainable yield goes down. Uh, if it's the other way around, it's the other way around. So that's kind of what he's saying there. So... Next, he says, at the other end of the spectrum is overpopulation. As population grows, recruitment rate increases, that uh, uh, recruitment rate being immigration and reproduction up to a certain point. If you were to graph this, it would appear as a rising curve, but as the population grows beyond this point, density-dependent factors like increased stress from interspecific interaction and habitat degradation from too many mouths negatively influence the population and recruitment rate declines as a mirror image of the previous growth. Basically, if you have a ton of deer on your property, they're going to eat themselves out of the property, and it, at some point it's going to spike. It's like a bell curve. At the top, you're going to have all these deer, and then it's just going to fall off because you have too many deer for the amount of room that you have for them and the amount of resources and food, and they're going to eat themselves to death, basically. Or they won't have enough cover to support all of them, so the predators are going to get them. So at some point, you can be overpopulated, and then the following years year or two years after that you're going to see a huge drop off and think what happened well you had too many deer for what your property could hold um i know i talked a little bit about that on the last video i did about the the doe population which is a big one in that um, definitely something you got to look out for he continues and says intuitively you would think that your objective should be to maintain your deer population at k the maximum number of deer habitat can comfortably support however what we've learned from studying both population models and real population is that in order to achieve your maximum sustained yield, the maximum proportion 
of deer you can annually remove from a population on a sustained basis, you need to maintain the population at about 50% of carrying capacity. He said this can be one of the most difficult concepts to grasp and to accept, but your deer herd will have its greatest productivity and provide the most animals available for harvest over the long term if you keep it around 50% of your carrying capacity. So you don't want to use up all your capacity with those deer if you're right at that maximum limit because then you have no room for error. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on something you don't hear about. And, and Mother Nature is, is not kind. She's cruel. And only the strong survive. If we go out here as hunters and what we consider ourselves as land managers and we go out and provide food for those deer during the winter, even in a hard winter, you're helping the not so strong survive. And that's when you can get in and Mother Nature is going to go, okay, I'll take care of this if you're not going to. And we have the big deer kills and the blue tongues and whatever else you want to call it. So you talk about sustainability and whatnot. I think that we should be careful how much food we're providing and what we're providing it for. Are we helping the ones that would normally succumb to coyotes because they're not strong enough to survive? Are we helping them live and pass on those genes that aren't very good? That's something to think about as what we consider ourselves land managers and survivability rates and all this other stuff. There's numbers there, and I don't I don't know what they are, but there's numbers there that I think we can be detrimental to ourselves. Exactly. So what you're saying too, and uh, like you said, land managers, if all you're doing is putting that food out there, and you're going in and planting your spring plots, and you got food for them all year round, and then you plant your winter plots, and you got food for them in the winter, and there's deer on your property all the time, and you're bringing in all these new deer, and you're never doing anything during the season. Me and Nate talked about this a little bit before. You're a habitat manager, which is great, but you're not a deer manager. And we want to be deer managers in order to have more mature deer on our property and have the population where it should be. You don't want to just be that habitat manager. You have to manage your deer herd, too, which is what what we're hitting on, what we're talking about. If you're just a habitat manager, Mother Nature will manage your deer for you. Yeah. If you don't. Mm -hmm. In a a Mm -hmm. big way. She's not going to just kill that. She is cruel. Yeah. She's not She won't kill it down to your 50% carrying (laughs) capacity. No. She'll She'll wipe it out. Exactly. Which has happened before. That's what we saw in 2012. Mm -hmm. Here in what the blue tongue epidemic, you know, and, you know, here here in our location here in Southern Illinois, you know, the food source is almost year round. You got your, you got your corn, you got your soybeans. You know, and and that that whether you plant food plots or not, there's a food source out there. You get you know an at least for the beginning part of the acres year. in the fall. You know, my milo, sorghum, whatever you want to call it. You know, and even after a corn harvest, you know the deer you'll see them out there, and they're picking up corn that the combine left behind, or or beans that the combine left behind, or any kind of uh annuals mm-hmm. you know natural annuals that come up winter annuals that come up you know they know what they need to live on and stuff and so yeah uh if you if you don't do anything but just habitat yeah. well you, you know, have mother, to be a deer mo- manager mother too. mother nature's going to take care of herself I, i've kept records since oh three uh, the deer that came in here and i can tell you all my records exactly the peak and the fall and and it was like that year that the peak was it was like everybody was seeing everything they wanted to killing everything they wanted to bucks galore deer mounts running out you know capes running out our rear end and everything else and then all of a sudden they just went to the bottom that's mother nature saying you guys didn't take care of it i will well Are that's we- just that's just like you know before that that was that me and you used to hunt scott you know, I'd go out there and I'd see thirty or forty deer of an evening, mm-hmm. and that was, you know, even though it was a two hundred acre woods, with farmland all around it, it could not sustain. Not in the winter time. No, it could not sustain that kind of population. Right. And so Mother Nature, she come in and she wiped it out. Now, also, you talk about your predators and stuff, and I'm not taking nothing away from it. Yeah, you need to manage your predators. But at the same time, the predators, they don't go after the healthy deer. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, they go after, 
they can spot the sick ones. They can spot mm-hmm. the injured ones. Easy for them. Yep. Yeah. You know, and then, so that's the ones that they're going after. So I'm not going to say, sit here and say, no, don't take care of your predator because cause your predators can get out of control also. Right. And, but there's a, there's a balance in there. Mm-hmm. And even though, even if we can't take care of that balance, manage that balance, mother nature will. Mm-hmm. Like with the predators thing, the what kind of a way to think about it is, let's just take a uh, hundred deer. So let's say your coyotes, uh, unmitigated, are going to take out a hundred deer on your property, but you want to kill five deer, whatever it is. We'll just say twenty for number's sake. You're not going to kill twenty deer, but we'll just say twenty for number's sake. Way to think about it. If uh, you're letting your coyotes kill, I'll still kill a hundred deer because there's that number of coyotes, and then you go kill twenty deer. Well, now you're 20 deer behind where you naturally would have been anyway. If you go in and kill the amount of coyotes it takes to get them down to 80 so you can kill the remaining 20, then that's where you want to be. That's that balance you're talking about. You have to be a predator in in a kind of a natural way and not an unnatural way. You still have to mitigate those predators, um, but not to the point where you kill so many of them that you're still only killing 20, but now those coyotes are only killing 40. Right. Well, now you've got 40 more deer that are unaccounted for that are coming back that would have been gone anyway. Uh, obviously, those numbers are just pulled out of the air. You're not going to kill 20 deer and all, all no, that No, unless you got it's just a way, nuisance. Well, all right. <laughs> it's just a way to think about it, um, a way to think about having that balance, which is what he goes into next. He says when things get out of balance, which in mo- ca- most cases, because the population is too high, there are two ways to achieve balance between your P and K. The first one which we've hit on, he says, is shoot does. One is to reduce P through trigger finger management, but it can be nigh onto impossible to convince some landowner deer hunters to remove enough does. It seems counterintuitive that removing a large number of does would actually increase the reproductive potential of the deer herd and provide a larger sustained yield, but it does. Note, I specifically said does, not just deer. That's because... Does represent the reproductive potential of the herd. So, uh, like he said, it's a little bit counterintuitive. But if you go in and you kill a doe, and you kill her in late season, and you need because you need to manage your herd and you're you're overpopulated. Um, if you go in and kill that doe after she's been bred, that's two or three deer that you've taken out for the next year, which is what you want because you're overpopulated, um, and that will allow for better deer the next year, not just more deer, but better deer. And it will keep you from being overpopulated to the point where everything goes downhill. Like we talked about. So that's kind of like what we're talking about with shooting does. That's one way he says to do it, which I think, and I know in my case, um, on several properties that I have permission to hunt, but don't have permission to manage the habitat on. That's the only way I can manage the herd as opposed to the other thing he says, which is improve the habitat said if you really struggle with removing a large number of does, the other way to restore balance is by increasing K, which is your uh, the amount of deer you can hold. Uh, Most of us are doing this anyway, and it involves every step to take to improve habitat from forest stand thinning to food plots. So, like I said, uh, there are certain properties I can do that on, there are certain properties I can't, so I have to shoot does. So whichever one works out for you, um, I don't know, Nate, kind of where you're at on that as far as your properties go which one you kind of lean more towards or or what experience you've had with either one of those as far as i know you hit on a little bit earlier but getting too many does kind of where your mindset goes as far as either shooting them or maybe i need to provide a little more food or a little more cover so i can hold these deer at the right number yep i want to carry as many as i can um i uh and that's just me that's just me uh and i don't uh i don't have years of factual numbers to back this up but where i'm at in my mind anyway i want to be able to carry all the deer that i can uh healthily i don't want to see them all run around uh looking sick you know uh in late winter because that ain't no way to be for them you know right um but i don't feel like food is a problem for me i think i got plenty uh all around me um i uh, just showing you guys a picture of a deer that probably weighs over 300 pounds yeah if not yeah. he's really close you yeah. know agreed um, he's doing well uh there's a donut shop out there somewhere i've not found <laughs> it yet <laughs> yeah. but i know it's there close you know and, yeah and he sits at the back door uh, yeah. but yeah. anyway he'd set up camp don't you? yeah <laughs> uh, i've got some does i know they've been there for a long time um uh, i mean 
the they've grown up there they've stayed right there on me stayed close anyway uh their noses look like they're a foot and a half long you know yeah. i mean they've been there for a long time they're having twins they might even have triplets sometimes you know uh i feel like i got enough right there for them uh to hold them there and we we do have a pretty good area like i said we don't have too much woods i got some woods that borders me uh, but we got some thick draws we got set aside and everything for them uh food plots and then crops all around um I'd rather do everything I can to carry all the deer that I can and be attractive to keep the deer there with me uh, to hopefully entice uh, a good buck to stay on me, you know, increasing my chances of getting a shot at him uh, rather than focusing on uh, keeping my number small and and trying to grow him and keep him, uh, if I can, in my mind, if I can carry more of them and sustain more of them. I'll have a better chance of getting a big buck in there. That's just where I'm at in my mind right now. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I wanted to ask you, Scott, um, where do you think we're anywhere close to the peak, uh, like you talked about right before everything fell off years ago? Do you think we're anywhere close to the peak again? Okay, because that I was I was young in my hunting career then. You know, um, I uh, I don't remember it like you guys do. I. I no. no, and the short answer is no. I don't think so. But we're we're climbing. Yeah. Uh, whether whether the state issues uh, better issues permits might be the word I'm looking for. Yeah. Whether they've got a better handle on the permit issuing that goes on now, uh, I don't know. That's yet to be seen. Uh, it's steadily climbed since then. It was flat for about two years, and then. Um, 12 is when it started. And then we got in our round of it. 14. And a little yeah. bit in 14, not as bad. Yeah. Uh, it was kind of the second generation of it. Yeah. And so we're we're six years removed from that, seven years removed from that. Yeah. Uh, but I think, uh, I probably by accident, but the state probably issued the right amount of permits for a couple years after that and it's kept the herd probably where it, where it belonged. Yeah. I'm sure it was by accident. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, well this is Illinois. Well, that's true. <laughs> We're not Iowa, unfortunately. <laughs> Very true. So the short answer is no. Uh I think we do need to be very mindful of that. Uh, yeah. Will it kill the deer out completely? No. Uh, yeah. But we will suffer a few years of hardships yeah. if we let this happen again. Yeah. And the idea is not to kill so many that we come back down because of what we've done. Oh yeah. But it's if we're getting close to that peak, to sustain that peak, whatever percentage that is, to like where the state issues enough permits where we're killing enough deer to keep it at a high number, which is, uh, he's going to hit on that a little bit, um, where we're still seeing deer and killing deer, but it's not getting so high that Mother Nature steps in. It's not getting so low that guys' success rates are down and nobody's shooting deer. Um, we have to do our job to keep it there. Uh, and, and especially... That's kind of on um, a macro level as far as across the state, what we're seeing, especially with your numbers, because it's obviously from a huge area of Illinois and even a little bit out of state occasionally. Um, on a micro level on your property, you can control that even more. Um, you will have problems on your property with overpopulation before we will have statewide more than likely. And then It'll be compounded when you're having problems, the next guy has problems, the next guy has problems. So if you can maintain it on your property, um, that's where you have to start. Because obviously we can't go out, I can't go kill all the deer that need to be killed in Williamson County and then come back and do it in Wayne County and go do it in Hamilton County. I can only do it on the properties that I can hunt. So it's kind of an individual responsibility we have as hunters to keep the herd where it needs to be, in my mind. Not only for killing those mature deer on our property but also so that we don't have those big hits and disease and stuff that comes along there's a magic number there somewhere uh, i'd like to think that the state biologists have a handle on that uh, again illinois mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know but uh, if there's advice out there from them the best we can do is is pay attention to it until we're proven uh, proven otherwise whether we I, like I, I it or think, not, I think the biggest mistake Illinois has made, and I know what the I know what their purpose in this is. <clears throat> you know, they're trying to get more revenue and stuff, but I think the biggest mistake they have made in general is giving two buck license or two buck tags out. You know, 
every you you're allowed to kill two bucks. I'm allowed to kill two bucks. You know, Scott, all of us we're all allowed to kill two bucks against one doe, and I don't. I, I think they've kind of. I know. I understand what they're doing. They're wanting the revenue because. Yep. Well, I'm just going to leave it at that. But you know, uh, I think that's a mistake because we're one of the few states in the union that has that kind of regulations as far as deer hunting goes. I know a lot of guys get uh, uh, they they're not very selective if they know they got a second back exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, if they know they got that one in their pocket. Are you old enough to remember when they didn't have that? You I've kill. heard stories about it. Okay, it so sounded <laughs> wild, wild. So so it's been. It's been a while. In your recent memory that, that we've always had to see prior to yeah. that, you could just, if you could buy a tag, you'd kill as many horns as you wanted to. I've, yeah. I've heard stories about it. It just sounded wild. There were a lot less mature deer yeah. in a lot less places then than there are now. Yeah. That, that For whatever reason they've done that, whether it was management or money or whatever, we can argue that, but it has helped the maturity oh, it's of Illinois the bucks. Illinois revenue. <laughs> yeah. It's helped the maturity of the yeah. bucks in yeah. our area. That could have turned us into the, uh, what, the guys in the Northwoods of Michigan. Mm -hmm. That could yeah. have turned us into that pretty yeah. quick in yeah. my yeah. mind. Yeah. Um, and just in going down to two tags, now you look at a state like Iowa, and this is getting on, a, again, a macro level and what the state can do. You can do this stuff on your own property without the state telling you you have to do it. Right. But as far as the state goes... Uh, you look again. Look at a state like Iowa, who, in my opinion, has one of the best states um, as far as wildlife management goes. And yeah, a lot of guys on TV are hunting Iowa, and you see that's a part of the reason you see a lot of big deer there. But Iowa has a lot of big deer in a lot of places. Some of that has to do with farm ground. A lot of it has to do with habitat. But a big part of it is the state and the way they manage it. An out of stater has to draw for a buck tag in Iowa. In Illinois, an out-of-stater just has to spend a considerable amount of money, but if they've got it, which most guys coming from out-of-state, if they're going to come all the way to Illinois to hunt, they they, that's it. not a problem for them. So they can still go and kill two bucks. Even residents in Iowa, you're limited to one buck unless you have landowner's tags as well, and then you can get maybe some other special tag like an urban area tag or something of that sort. There's just a big difference in some of the better states and, and where we're at as far as our state goes, where their mind is more towards revenue as as opposed to wildlife management, which is, I think, like what I talked about earlier with the bobcats, we're going to see an issue with that. Um, they'd rather have those permits and have the revenue for it and have a limited number instead of just letting us responsible hunters, and obviously not all of us are responsible, but the majority of us take care of the problem and keep it at bay where it needs to be. Um, even a state like Missouri which I, it doesn't have a great program as far as whitetail management goes, but they're at least trying to model themselves more after Iowa than Illinois. Um, I know, I assume it's still the same way. At one time, you had to have four points on one side of a buck before you could even shoot it in Missouri. Is that the best thing in the world for mature deer? Not necessarily, because you might, again, have a two-and-a-half-year-old ten-pointer, and then you got a six-and-a-half-year-old six-pointer that you can't shoot, so you end up shooting the two-and-a-half-year-old. But at least it's something. Um, more times than not, it's gonna be it's gonna help. Uh, but we're we're at the point uh, we're in a state in Illinois that they're not gonna take care of this stuff. So we, as guys that are whether you're a property owner or you got permission to hunt a property, whatever that ground you're hunting is, we got to take it kind of on ourselves and be that deer manager. And then not only will a state see the benefit from that, everybody else will see the benefit from that on our own properties hunting. And be able to kill more mature deer. Yeah, just because you can kill two bucks doesn't mean you have to. Doesn't mean you have to. Now, if you've got two deer that are four and a half plus years old and you want to shoot them both, by all means. Oh, knock yourself go out. For it, but, you know, I, I, if I, you're I, wanting I, to kill mature deer. Right. Um, but like you said, don't you, if you're wanting to kill those big bucks, don't use that first one as a, oh, I got that little young three and a half year old deer. I'm going to shoot him with my first tag because I know I can kill that Boone and Crockett with my second one. Just because you can get two doesn't mean you have to use two. The like good you said, yeah. The good thing about having two, though, is if you're managing, uh, now we're talking about managing buck herds. We're not talking about just going out and killing deer, right. which is fine. If you're managing buck herds and you've got that three and a half year old six pointer that doesn't have any brow tines or that's never going to make anything mm -hmm. or, or that, that big bruiser that just is, is just 
120 inch five year old deer weak yeah you, you can use that one tag to manage your herd and mm-hmm. still have another tag to kill that guy that you're after mm-hmm. you can do true. that you can do true. that yeah you don't have that's to have a, a sacrificial point. year exactly yeah, yeah that's right. a good point yeah so uh, i stand well, corrected <laughs> No, well, I mean, it's just it's just well, an it's just like it's just you like may not couple, be in that situation though, right? A couple of years ago, there was on my property there was a really nice. I mean, he was a six and a half year old buck. I mean, you can just tell it. I mean, he had that big sway and swagger to him. You know, the hog back on back, sway back. I mean, he he was just the king, mm-hmm. and he he was the four corn. That was it. Mm-hmm. He had main beams, you know, 28 inches long or whatever, and he was probably two foot wide. He had no brow tines. He had about a 12 inch tine on each side, and that was all of it. And, you know, he needed to be taken out. And so, you know, a guy could have used that extra tag to take him out and then go do whatever you wanted to do. We'll get back to the article here Optimum sustainable yield for your deer herd. Now that most of you have hopefully bought into the MSY concept, you can, which is the uh, maximum sustained yield concept, you can throw it out. Under normal circumstances, if there's such a thing, it is nearly impossible to achieve that. One of the principal reasons, as alluded to, is it's difficult to get folks to accept the idea of removing enough deer. Then, as anyone who has tried to tell you, it's even harder to accomplish. For obvious reasons, hunter success declines with lower deer numbers. There are fewer deer to see and kill. Numerous research studies have also demonstrated an inverse relationship between hunting pressure and success. As hunter numbers of hunter hours increase, deer move less during daylight and more in thicker cover. One study showed they even learned to avoid permanent stands. As a more reasonable and realistic middle ground, Dr. James Kroll, who I don't know if we've hit on an article from him from North American Whitetail or not, but I know he's got a lot in there, so he's a well-known guy. Um, As he suggests, shooting for optimum sustained yield rather than maximum which he defines as that population density that best maximizes both deer harvest and hunter satisfaction. He's found it has achieved around 60 to 70% of your, uh, of K, which is your maximum capacity. So hunters will see plenty of deer, but the deer population is still held far enough below K that the habitat doesn't suffer and a high yield can be sustained. It also leaves enough wiggle room for annual fluctuations and extrinsic, extrinsic, factors like severe winters drought fire anything that might temporarily lower p or k so that's kind of where he wraps that up um 60 to 70 percent if you can keep your deer at 60 to 70 percent of your maximum capacity that's a really good place to to be because you're still seeing a lot of deer but it's not so many that you're killing your own habitat so i think that's that's probably pretty close to where you want to be i mean that he's dr james kroll um obviously really studied guy uh, very respected in the deer management world. Uh, I'd have to agree with what he's saying. I mean, I'm in no place to disagree with what he's saying there on the 60, 70 percent. Seems seems pretty reasonable to me. Yeah. Um, also, uh, I was going to see if you guys had any strategies on uh, doe management. What does do you want to shoot? Uh, for me, uh, I'm going to look for. Uh, a doe that hopefully he's got a button buck with her early season. If I'm uh, if I'm out there looking to put one in the freezer, I'm going to try to find one that's got a button buck with her. If she's got two button bucks with her, she's a prime candidate in my book. Um, I've heard guys say, uh, guys that are supposed to be a lot smarter than me, say that uh, they've done studies you know, that show those button bucks are probably going to stay right there. Mm-hmm. Um, so you don't know what he's going to turn out to be, but it's got a buck that hopefully will stay right there you know, where he's been raised. Uh, early in the season they should be right there where they where they've been comfortable they say that there's a good chance that they're going to stay right there so i'm going to look for a doe that's got a button buck especially if she's got two button bucks with her that'd be a prime one for me to take out that's just one thing i'm looking for uh and then of course those old gray-faced ones that Mm -hmm. they stand there on the edge of the field and they look for you and then if she blows at me, she is automatically number one (laughs) she's automatically on the list (laughs) oh now don't be like that yeah (laughs) oh man i uh I must stink, you know, I mean, they'll, they'll stand out there and they'll, they'll walk back and forth and pace and mm-hmm. they'll look in the tree, you know, she'll have caught a whiff of me and she'll mess with me till she finds me. Mm-hmm. She is the one I'm after at that point. I'm with you. But, on... she, but she's also probably the one that's going to produce twins or triplets. Also. Oh yeah. Oh so yeah. You got to take old... that con- into consideration. Oh yeah. Those old ones that are the, the mature ones, they've been there, you know, 
uh, their body knows that they got a good food supply there. They're going to have a lot of fawns right. for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, when they get to, when they get to be too smart, uh, in my opinion, I don't have any use for them anymore. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I'm with you on both of those things you said because, like, the first part of that with the button bucks, I think the average dispersal rate of a button buck is somewhere around is like one to two miles if it grows up with its mother still there and grows up with that mature doe that that uh, it was born with. If you shoot that doe, that shrinks way down to like hundreds of yards dispersal rate from where it grew up. So like you said, if you can shoot that mature doe that's got a button buck or two with her, a lot more chance that that buck's going to stay on your property. And then that's, if she's got two button bucks with her and that two to one thing you're talking about, uh, you've just made that, doubled that uh, because now you've got two bucks that are likely going to stay on your property yep. rather than go somewhere else after they've done grown up. You've just made it more than right. Exactly. Um, the only thing is, you know, towards the end of the October or whatever, the rut and that starts kicking in and stuff. And then those are, they're going to chase them button bucks off. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. I mean, they're, for and sure. that's part of that dispersal rate. If you right. shoot yeah. that, their mom, she's not going to chase them off on average. If you don't shoot, if you if you can shoot that doe, there's a lot more chance that those button bucks are going to stay on you and grow up on your property and stay there. Um, and then, like you said on the second thing, not only just those does that blow at you, obviously they're automatically at the top of the list. Like that one you talked about last week that found you every time you went to the oh, woods. Oh, I hated that doe. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> those are the ones, for me, once they reach a certain maturity, they do get too smart. They know too much. And then the the ones that are hanging around them, are getting smart too yeah. because if that bigger mature doe sees you then that other one sees you then they remember that so if you can kill those mature does that have been producing for you for three four or five years they've done their part it's time to go for them uh, the other thing that i'll add to that is a couple years ago on behind your house jeff where we don't shoot a lot of does just because of the way the property is uh, the way we hunt it the neighbors do take care of quite a few does there uh there was a really cool doe on camera. It had some of those pictures where she was smelling the camera, and she had this white diamond right between her eyes. And to me, that would have just been a really cool doe to shoot. It's kind of like a target buck. You know, if I was going to shoot a doe in there, she probably would have been one I'd have taken. And, you know, just because she had that kind of cool characteristic about her, and it would have been a cool deer to shoot. Um, if they've got some something else cool, a lot of white on them, you know, whatever, If as long as they're mature. Um, but I think I'm kind of with you on the same strategy as far as if she's gotten button bucks, definitely a candidate to be shot for me. Those really old wily does that gray face, long nose that know you're there. Um, if I can outsmart them and get them, I think you're all the better for it as far as your deer herd uh, not being that smart. If you can uh, And out. there's nothing to be taken away from outsmarting an old doe, let me tell you. Mm-hmm. It's not easy. No, it's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy at all. And but uh, you remember, didn't you have that? Uh, I never had no problem with him. Man, well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> but didn't you have that? They're on my property. Didn't you have that? Uh, the, what we call her, the old humpback. Yeah, and she's still there. I got a picture of her this year too. Is she? And she's she's, she's still producing twins, ain't she? Uh, yeah, and she's been there for. We got pictures of her for at least three years, at and I know three. you know she was there well before that. Yeah. Uh, she's a... I'd say she's a five-year-old deer. At least. And if you not know, six. Maybe yeah. six. Um, she's getting to that point where if it was a property, like I said, that's not necessarily a strategy for us on that property. Right. The mm-hmm. way it sets up, it's more of a rep property anyway. Kind of fall what you were talking about, mm-hmm. is we can have the does on there, then that at least will bring the bucks in during the fall, or during the rut, because they're not going to stay there anyway. Yeah. Um, there's not a lot we can do to get them to stay there, the way everything is around there. Um, but... If it was a property where we were going to manage the doe herd a little more and had to worry about that with the neighbors not doing it, she would definitely be a top candidate at this point because she's getting to that that stage where she's really smart. Um, well, here's a, here's a question for you. So her life expectancy is what, one, maybe two more years probably? At yeah. Least. She's about peaked. Okay. Yeah. yeah so peaked. if you kill her, you've eliminated one doe for one year. Yep. If you kill a younger doe, you've eliminated that doe for the next five years. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So you're not killing a smarter doe by the younger one, but you're killing a deer that's going to produce more than the older doe. Mm-hmm. Now, having said that, depends on what you're looking to manage. That old doe is probably as regular as time. She's coming in 
Mm -hmm. at the same time and the same buck for the last three years is going to know that and and so if you kill her you've you know that old boy that's been around hammering that for the last two or three years is probably going to know that versus oh so well so i mean what's your what's your strategy on that are you are you thinking the old doe's better for herd management or just better because i don't like her well i think it's the old doe may be better for uh as far as a hunting strategy as far as the deer not knowing you're there and being as smart as far as the herd management goes i still think it's okay because she's likely going to be at the stage where she's producing triplets or or twins to the until she dies she's probably having twins or triplets if you kill that two or three year old though she may still be at the point where she's only having one a year but like you said uh, maybe she's doing that for three four more years you know the old timers used to say that does wouldn't produce triplets unless it depend on the population and that's that's true and 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 here's the thing i don't i'm not a biologist I have no, no well i'm not either i don't know but i have to look that up I'm, i mean i'm, I'm serious just, that's what I the know. old guys used to say yeah and i'm I, i'm just an observationist but a what you heard me observationist oh but anyway if you get now you made me lose my track train of thought <laughs> yeah you're observing i am observing but you got a lot of it depends on your uh what do you call it k your the what the amount you can the pop, amount of population you can sustain on your right. property. All right, right, fine. So if you can sustain three or four deer, extra deer a year, and and not hurt your your habitat or your population, well then let by all means let that old doe that you know puts out twins or triplets let her go. If you can't, and if your habitat is hurting and your population is hurting because of it then take her out Mm -hmm. you know i mean it's just it's just that simple but you've got to figure that out for yourself and for your own personal uh property that you're trying to manage yeah Yeah. you know what's good for my property ain't necessarily good for a property Mm -hmm. five miles down the road from me or 10 or whatever you know whatever their home range is right you know and so you got it it just varies from place to place Mm -hmm. also what you touched on too scott was you know about the the old timers what the hell did you say about that yeah well they used to say that a a doe would throw singles if the population was where it should be if the population was down they were more likely to throw doubles or triples i have no idea if it have you ever heard that it, heard, it gave them I, something to talk about at least. Well, but, yeah, but right, there's got to sure. be some truth to it. I don't there's know whether there is or not. But I've, there's got to be. Back in the day, where I was wild and crazy, you know, we used to run coyotes with hounds. And one of the old houndsmen's always told me that, you know, the more coyotes you take out of the population that year with the dogs, the more coyotes you're going to have the next year. Because whatever survives are going to produce more pups because there's more food. Same way with deer. You know, if you take out, whether it's you, Mother Nature, whatever, takes out the deer population, you know, if if the habitat can sustain, uh, you know, a big population, well, then they're going to put out less fawns. If it can, well, then they're going to put out more. It'd be interesting to see what the fawn rate was in 13 and 14. It would be. I'd oh, like, yeah. I'd like to have those numbers. 2012 yeah. blue tongue where yeah. it just wiped everything out. It'd be interesting to see if there's any studies out there. Yeah. But you know where I'm going the, with that. that. Yeah. You know, sure, com- I understand. Comparing yeah. the coyotes to, sure. the, to the deer, I mean, Mother Nature, it don't matter if you're a coyote, deer, or fox, or whatever, yeah. coon, you know, she's going to take care of all of it. Yeah. And so... And I think I, uh, it'd be interesting to know. Oh yeah, you know, from 2012, like you said, to 13, 14, 15, what was the birth rate of the fawns? Yeah, and there's no fight for food then. Yeah, no, no, no a, a lot food. less, definitely a lot, yeah, a less. lot less. Yeah, and obviously they're uh, at some point they're still going to have too many fawns because you wouldn't have that overpopulation we're talking about. So they're not going to obviously take care of it themselves completely. Um, now who knows that may have just been something that 
Bob from down the road saw on his property. Well, I, you know, had this many deer and they only had this many fawns and then it just snowballed from there. There could be some truth to it. It'd be interesting to see like you're talking about. But I think what you're saying, Jeff, lends itself more to killing that doe with the button bucks because at least if they're going to have more deer the next year, you've got more bucks to kind of balance it out. If you shoot that doe that's got the does with her and, and they stick around and the bucks leave, well, then maybe you're just going to have more does again. So if you're taking out three deer and then they come back with five deer because they're more food, at least you're taking out, uh, you know, does instead of taking out those bucks. Your producers. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there is an old guy up there. Uh, well, I say he's, old. he's not old. Um, anyway, uh, he, uh, the older you get, the younger old becomes, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, Oh, no, you think, man, Scott's uh, old. I never said that. <laughs> uh, this guy up there, uh, uh, I had said something about, oh, I shot this uh, deer. It was a button buck. You know, I thought it was a doe. I just sure it was a doe. I got up there and he had buttons, you know. Uh, and he said, I don't feel bad about it. He said, you only took out one buck. He said, you don't know. He might be that big junker that you're talking about. You know, he might be a 120-inch five-year-old. Or he could have been a monster in the making. You never know. Mm -hmm. But he said, if you take out one button buck, you've took out one buck. That ain't going to matter. He said, if you shoot a doe, you're killing her and you're killing every buck she might ever have. And that's true. Yeah. You know? Yeah, to some extent. I think that's true. I uh, mean, but obviously, I, uh, if she's dead, she ain't have no more bucks. Yep. But. Uh, and I, uh, and that's just something he told me to try to make me feel better about shooting a button buck I didn't want to shoot. <laughs> but right. it, but right. anyway... Uh, if you think about it, there is some Hey, they taste good, it. too. Yeah, they do. That's yeah. right. I think that's pretty much we hit on everything I wanted to hit on tonight. So we'll go ahead and close it out. Um, we'll be As we go along, we'll get more into some rut stuff. I know we've had some people kind of request a, we talk about that. Um, we'll get into that as the season goes along. So, again, thanks for listening. Catch us again next week. Hey, I'd just like to add one thing, if I may. Okay. Uh, this weekend is the start of the Illinois youth uh, mm -hmm. shotgun season. Today, when this is going on. So well, this right. is Thursday night. We record this tonight, or, you know, right, Thursday night or whatever. But Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Yeah. I, you know, all of us from Clark's Locker and Ridge Hunter Outdoors, we'd like to wish everybody the best of luck, all the young hunters. Mm -hmm. We want to uh, commend the parents that's out there. Because it's going to be hot this yeah, weekend. Yeah. We want to commend them for being out there and sweating it out with their kids and fighting getting them out mosquitoes in the outdoors. and getting them out in the outdoors and teaching them stuff. And, you know, just aim small, shoot small. That's right. And uh, go have fun. Yeah. Go stay have fun. what makes you happy. Go have fun and stay safe. Yep. That's right. Okay. That'll do it for this week. Thanks, guys.